Next, what I would like to do is introduce you to our panelists. So first to my right, I have Janae Girard. Janae um, is a native Texan and started her own veterinary distri 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 distribution distribution, <laughs> <laughs> distribution located um, in Central Texas. Um, in 2010, she created a website called beyondthebooby-trap.com that has over 29,000 breast cancer followers and over 2.1 million interactions on Facebook per month. Certainly way busier than I am. Um, her breast cancer book is a humorous, well, real, real world portrait of getting through the trauma and recovery of breast cancer and is called Off the Rack, Chronicles of a 30-something Single Breast Cancer Survivor. Janae acts as a business consultant on how to leverage your social media tribe, as well as how to gain corporate sponsorship to grow your market presence. She's an active motivational speaker and mentor, and she's completing a national mastectomy swimsuit campaign in May for the clothing company Land's End. So welcome to Janae. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Next to her, I have Dale Milner. Dale is a licensed clinical social worker with over 30 years of experience offering psychotherapy to individuals. She's a certified, trained sex therapist and specializes in sexual dysfunction, intimacy, and couples issues. Um, early in her career, she worked in protective services, helping families where there was physical, sexual, uh, or sexual abuse or neglect, and then went on to become a psychiatric social worker in a medical facility where she worked with hospitalized psychiatric patients and their families, as well as medical patients who had emotional pro problems related to their illnesses or home situations. In 30 years of private practice, she has helped hundreds of clients resolve their problems and live happy, more productive lives. And in turn, helped us last year with producing another class um, that we had here at Livestrong. So welcome back. And finally, I have Penny Deku, who is a licensed clinical social worker and the director of mission at Cancer Connection here in Austin. Penny's professional experience began as a patient navigator for the American Cancer Society Highland Plains Navigation Center followed by several years as a staff social worker at Texas Oncology in Austin, Texas. Currently, she is the director of an Austin-based nonprofit called Cancer Connection. This organization facilitates emotional supportive peer matches between cancer survivors of the same or similar diagnosis. She graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago with a master's degree in social work. She also holds a health science degree in natural medicine from the Southern School of Natural Therapies in Melbourne, Australia. Penny has a strong interest in holistic health, community collaboration, and supportive counseling for chronic illnesses. So thank you to you all for coming. So first, we're gonna start with Dale. Um, I've asked her to talk a little bit about just generally emotions and how our brain works and just sort of lay the foundation for things that we'll be talking about. And then we'll open it up for questions and um, encourage you all to ask questions as well. Thank okay, you. thank you for giving me this opportunity to come and speak with you today. Um, I did think it would be helpful to have a fundamental understanding of how our bodies work in relation to our emotions. Now, I'm not much of an artist, but what I've, hopefully you all can see this. This is a, a view of our brain. And one of the best ways to understand our emotions is to think about the fact that when we were evolving as a species, we evolved from our spinal cord on up. So here we have our spinal cord. We have the brain stem, which takes care of the autonomic or the automatic aspects of our bodies, our heart rate, blood pressure, all of those things that we don't really have any control over. Sitting right on top of the brain stem is our limbic system. And this particular part is where our emotions reside. And from there, as we continued to evolve, we developed the frontal lobes, this part of the brain, which is the part that controls our learning uh, our imagination, our ability to make judgments, to collect new information. Now, because we developed from the bottom up, there are way more pathways, neuronal pathways, that go from south to north, so to speak. So everything goes through the emotional center. 
And that's why we are feeling our feelings 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We never get a break from feeling. The purpose of emotion or feeling is, let's break the word down, emotion, energy, motion. Our emotions give us instantaneous information about how to deal with our world. And the primary focus of emotions is to ensure that we stay alive. It's our survival mechanism. So for example, when we are confronted with something that's frightening, say a car crosses our path, we instantaneously react. The adrenal glands start you know, flowing, the cortisol, we have that uh, reaction of panic. Well, you don't have time for the, uh, the frontal lobes, the neocortex, to react and say, you know, there's a car, I should get out of the way. You just react. And so, again, the limbic system is about survival. One of the lobes inside the limbic system, which thalamus, hypothalamus, is the amygdala, which is a little almond-shaped uh, structure that our fight or flight reaction, that's where all that is going on. And so when we are feeling our emotions each and every day, we have basic emotions anger, uh, fear, uh, pleasure, sadness. And if you think about all the other emotions, they probably fall under those subcategories. So those are basic emotions. And if you stop and think about it, each of those emotions give us very specific information about how we need to deal with our world and how we're going to best react to it. Now, because there's more uh, pathways going to our frontal lobes, it doesn't mean that we can't develop through learning and understanding, we can affect our emotions. <clears throat> Pardon me. So that as we learn, you know, knowledge is power. So you all are here trying to learn about emotions. That can be extremely helpful to you in helping you deal with your emotions. So your emotions are going to include reflexes or things that just come with the basic model. So you don't have to learn that an animal baring its teeth, growling, coming at you is something dangerous. You know that. You're born with that. But our life's experiences also teach us certain things and program our limbic systems. But for those of you going through cancer, most of you have not gone through this before. This is a new experience. So you still may be tapping into other experiences that you've had in the past, and some of those same feelings may, coming, may come up to the surface. But it's still a new situation. So you're going to have all sorts of feelings that you have to keep learning how to deal with, keep adapting, keep changing. And one of the things that's important to um, remember is that the breath, and I hope you all can see my shirt. <laughs> Everybody dressed up nicely. But I wanted to um, give you all this message that uh, reside in the breath. The breath is the centerpiece of all emotion. So as you are feeling different feelings, you go through anger, you go through fear, you go through sadness, you feel pleasure. The breath will help you through all of these different feelings. And so, you know, with anger, the, the breath might be, you know, labored and tense. And with sadness, you know, it might be, ah, oh, yeah, I feel sad. And so because the breath is something we can control, it can be a useful tool in helping us deal with all sorts of emotions that we're confronted with. 
Okay, so that's just a little uh, overview of emotions so you all have a better idea of what's happening in your brain. Okay. Great, so if, if anyone has any questions in our live studio audience, you're welcome to go up to the microphone and ask questions. If not, we can um, elicit some as well. Does anyone have any? Yes, please. this, uh, all of you, and uh, all that uh, the strong does. Um, my question is, is that uh, the, the onset of cancer, your, the treatment procedures, and then the afterwards, uh, the, so sorry. So at any rate, the question is, is, is that you're going, you know, through this whole deal, uh, and then the treatment ends, and then you sort of retreat back to a safe area. Uh, and, and you're not necessarily facing it. It, it. it was there and now it's gone and you're just sort of hoping for better days, but then you're really not dealing with it. You know, you're it, it, sort of burying it or whatever. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the deal of, of bringing it up to the forefront. So that's more or less the question. So how do you, how do you, how do you bring it up? Okay. So, so he's asking after you, after treatment's finished, you know, and you're, you're left <laughs> with this aftermath, what are you supposed to do? I mean, how do you deal with the emotions of it, correct? And um, being a cancer survivor, I was diagnosed at, at 36, and um, I was running a company, and, um, you know, I had this pretty steady life, um, and after I was finished with treatment, you know, dur well, during treatment, I had that team, okay? I had that team that helped me every day um, and it, it was a support system so no matter what I knew that I could go to one of those people and, and I always had that team and it was okay my friends didn't necessarily get it because they had never dealt with cancer they didn't know the stress they didn't know about going through chemo about going through surgery and what that was like and um, I, I could go to them but they always did the I call it the awe face like oh you know and I didn't really want that either. I just wanted somebody to listen. And um, when I was finished, um, I, I call it kind of treading water. You're, you're, you're trying to figure out where to go and what to do and how to deal with the emotional portion of it. And it's such a good question. Um, you kind of get kicked out the door, if you will. And some of the ways and the tools, and I know these professionals have great tools, I'm sure, but one of the biggest tools that I used was to immerse myself in helping other people. And that externalized a lot of that fear and that pain for me. And so when I would go out and I would help people, um, w whatever that looked like, it could be children, it could be um, my other breast cancer survivors or just being that listener that I didn't necessarily have, um, it, it externalized all of those fear elements that I had and it really helped me because I didn't keep it inside. So that might be a tool that you could use um, to, to help move forward. And um, did you have something? Or? I'm not sure if this speaks to your statement, but um, I worked at a, a cancer center for several years, and a lot of people talked about, you'd think when you finished treatment and chemotherapy, and you get a certificate, and they throw some confetti, and you walk out, that, you know, yay! But they actually talked about a real feeling of kind of post-treatment blues, and in some ways, a feeling of separation from a really unique kind of family that you had that had just gone through this very, you know, life or death situation with you, literally. And whether that be the staff members, whether that be your doctor, whether that be just people you've begun to interact with in your infusion room. And it's a very, it's a very interesting phase. I think being aware of it is a really good beginning that there is, can be that, that post-treatment blues 
but then that's that treading water. It's what you make of it that really, really comes after that, but it's very normal is what I would say. And I guess one other point I would make is that I would hope that you all would take advantage of the services here at Livestrong and throughout the country and the world for that matter, so that you're not really stuffing feelings. What I'm hoping you all get out of this presentation is an encouragement to feel your way through this experience, not just tough it out. You know, sometimes you have to do that, but because emotions ebb and flow and they come and they go and sometimes you're feeling one emotion, sometimes it's another, and that may be in a five minute period of time. But if you develop a conscious awareness of it, it really helps tremendously to deal with it, to understand it, and to dissipate the energy. Because as I said earlier, emotions, create energy and if we're stuffing it's going to be in there somewhere and as you say afterwards when you let your hair down that energy has to be dissipated mm -hmm. and it can go against you or it can go outward and, and so you know that's what also, it, I, I think that one of the, one of the biggest feelings that I felt after treatment was depression I mean I, I fought with it it was ugly and um, I had to, you know, when we talk about these tools that you use when you're at the lowest of the low, um, one of mine was gratitude meditations, where I would actually go through the exercise of talk, or going through my mind about what I was grateful for and everything that I was grateful for. I would get in such a low spot, um, not just physically, but in mentally, um, you know, from all the different things that I went through that um, depression was it was the hardest, and it, it's it's like this you know thing on your shoulder. You know, I mean, it can be really really heavy, and it can bring you down. It can make you complacent. It can um, put you into isolation. Um, been there. Uh, it can pull you away from friends and family um, in a negative way. So once you develop that toolkit, whatever it is that works for you you've got to mentally be able to, to call on those tools and say, okay, I need to go through this exercise. I need to do this. I need to, like she was talking about being in um, servitude for somebody else, or I need to have um, a mechanism where I can go through what I'm grateful for in my life um, that helps pull you out. And it, different tools work for different people. And once you find those tools, uh, you become a lot more healthier because you can, to speak into the mic because the online audience can't hear you. So if okay. you have a comment, if you can step up there. Okay. No, you're, you're fine. Thank you. I think the gentleman in the yellow t-shirt had a comment. <laughs> Come on down. I was just remo remembering where we were in the building. Um, my, my daughter's best friend, she was actually going through breast cancer at the same time as going through brain cancer. And I guess the only there's a lot of these great things but the one thing that we all have in common is you talked about breath is we all are bodies at the end of the day and i guess being in the livestrong building whether it's a, a 5k or walking a half marathon or you know doing a bike ride like the exercise itself will feed the the feeling so i mean that's that's the only piece of advice to give my friend i mean there are different tools for different people but i don't think there's any of us that whether we just go out and walk half a block or go train for a marathon that that it, it isn't going to help us so to not be ex not, not let the emotions be exempt from the fact that they're connected to a body. One of the things I, I love about what you just said in one of the things that uh, Dale talked about, um, you know, our brain weighs 2% of our body weight, but it requires 25% of our oxygen. So it's something like 75% of the calories we take in. That's crazy. Yeah. And are you, weren't we trying to discover the, the stress yourself thin or think yourself thin diet? <laughs> 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 Haven't mastered that. Yeah. And this is, this is, I was not um, paid to plug this in any way, but a lot of people who came through the treatment center I was at really enjoyed going to the Live Strong at the Y groups mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, once again, there was a, you know, yes, it's about the exercise. In another way, it was also sort of an informal support group, helping them, people have a certain camaraderie of having gone through the, gone through the um, experience together, and it, it was a nice transition for them. 
questions right now? So we've had um, some questions online that there's been a couple of themes. I wonder if we could. Um, I think we have another oh, question here. Sure, if, if you could go up to the mic, that would be helpful. Thank you. question across uh, without getting emotional but I'm going to give you a little glimpse as to so you can understand my question okay. on October 2010 um, lost a, a sister to cancer and then um, of course I have another little sister who's going through cancer we had gone through kind of like a victory because uh, they had taken out like a tumor and we were like yes you know we were all happy whatever and um, about three or whenever she got I guess once they remove a tumor, they diagnose some other, they do some other diagnosis for sure. So anyway, so we were, I was expecting to hear good news from her. Unfortunately, it didn't happen like that. So what she ended up saying was that they actually ended up finding a different type of cancer, completely different than what the one she had, where she ended up having, um, oh, I can't think of the first cancer she has. But anyway, the second one ended up being that melanoma cancer. Well, of course, when she first was diagnosed with her first cancer, I wanted, I felt very, I wanted to help her out, be her support system. Uh, this sister is not here in Austin. She lives actually in Michigan. But nevertheless, I remember I got into the computer. We would be on the phone. She'd be look at this information online. What does this drug do? Um, what is this cancer? Whatever. Well, when she told me about the second cancer, I don't know all of it. I just, I didn't have the same empowerment to say, let me get on the laptop and let me find out about this particular cancer, let me see where it's gonna lead, because she's not doing any type of treatment whatsoever. Uh, we're very spiritual, spiritual. that's really uh, what's actually really kept us going, but I wanna be able to research this particular cancer and be able to empower herself and, my, and me so that I can help her because I'm her support system. But every time I, it just, I'm like, I don't wanna know. I don't wanna, I don't wanna read more about it or what have you, so that's my question. Why is it difficult? Is it something that we're in denial? Because I was asking my other sister, older sister Gloria, I said, is it something that we're in denial? Because I can tell that my sister is going through different, is, kind of changing, you know, it, it's, it is kind of different, you know, I can see differences in what she's going through than what was maybe when she first got diagnosed maybe a month ago or two with the second melanoma, I think it's melanoma cancer that she has, which is some type of skin cancer, that much I do know, but supposedly it's not outside in her skin, it's on the inside. So that's my question, why is it so difficult, why can't I just, and I have a laptop, I have computers, I love knowledge because I've always said knowledge is power. This is one knowledge that I don't want to know, but it's facing me. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, I'll, I'll have a go at it. Uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head when you said that you may be in denial. Denial is an important coping mechanism. And, and from, if I understood you correctly, this is something that's happened very recently. So the function of denial, and there is a normal function for every emotion, including depression. So denial is helping you to marshal your energy. It's the kind of thing that allows us to deal with a shock. And this is very much of a shock to have your thoughts go in one direction and then to be you know, knocked off track into another direction with something that is so intense and difficult and difficult for you to process. So again, your, your head is telling you, get on the internet, study, learn. Your emotions are going, oh no, I can't, this is too big, this is too hard, this is too awful. But the function of denial is to help pace ourselves. I think you'll come out of it. I think that just acknowledging it tonight is the first step. If you don't have unrealistic expectations of yourself, 
that, oh, I'm going to do everything I can. But maybe it's the kind of thing where, you know, talk with your other sister about it or talk with someone around here or come talk to me. And just to begin to deal with your feelings before you move on to dealing with your sister. Because you have feelings as well, and they can be a roadblock to accomplishing what you want to accomplish. So a little bit of attention to yourself is not being selfish. It's healthy. The okay? other thing, too, that I want to bring up is that that first diagnosis, you're able to deal with it, right? You put a lot of energy there, didn't you? Well, having something else right behind it, you're depleted. Or there's a good chance you're depleted. You don't have the energy to go after the research and, you know, I, I mean, I can tell you that that happened to me when I had my diagnosis and I went through surgery, I got an MRSA infection. So I had to back up and start over and I had to dig deep and like go and just figure out how I was going to get those reserves to where I needed them to be in place to even deal with it because I had to go through probably a year more than what your average bear has to go through. You know, yeah, that'd be great. So I, I think that, you know, having something secondary where you've already put a lot of energy towards something in the beginning too is very depleting. Exactly, so. and then also uh, listening to the same things that, because my sister that passed in 2010, she was actually here, so I was actually able to go through a lot of the process that she kind of that she went through um so now hearing her go through the same the kind of the same process and even more deeper this time than the last time it's like it's like oh my gosh you know how do we do this but i have always been the strong one in the family because i'm the second to the oldest and then it was my baby sister that passed in 2010 and then it's her that has a cancer the one that has a cancer is going through it right now she was diagnosed prior to the other one, but the other one's the one that she, she was already too advanced. But with this one, for whatever reason, when she got diagnosed with the first cancer, she's actually survived a lot longer than, because they had already, with the first cancer, had given her the six months to a year that they gave her, whatever. She passed all that. So we were like at a, oh, you know, all of this, and then all of a sudden comes this second type of cancer that we're not even aware of anything about and it just well we I, I love the fact that you revel in victory i love that um that's really important it is important to celebrate those little victories whatever they look like so i'm really proud of you for doing that in the beginning now this second thing that came behind you and gave you a, the secondary punch if you will i get that too but you also have to take care of yourself um you have to take care of yourself and make sure that you you like to shoulder, is what I'm hearing. You, you shoulder a lot of the responsibility of information, and you want to do what's right. You want to do what's best for them, and I appreciate that. Exactly, and she's open up. She actually had a, an appointment today, and she, when I, it's more of an inspiration when I hear how positive she mm -hmm. is because then she inspires me because I'm like, man, if she has this, she's going through it. I'm not, and there she's all inspired. So she's actually opening up to me saying, you know, you need to get on the computer. So that's kind of opened it up for me today to say, okay, sis, is, so then we want to know then what's really going on in your, in your body or what have you. So it's just make a, sure you're taking care of yourself too. Well, and, you know, and just one, one quick point. Uh, you know, I said earlier when I was talking about how we uh, work, how our brain works, I was saying, you know, most of you have never been through this before, but in this situation, you have been through it before. So the emotions that you have experienced in the past, that's creating energy, emotional energy, and that's something that you're having to fight with because you know you've been there. This isn't the first time. And so, you know, you don't want to feel those feelings. You don't want to, to have to be going through this again. And so that's why I'm saying taking care of yourself and spending a little bit of time and that energy and that strength that you have taking care of yourself will enable you then to be there for your sister. And absolutely, there's no way to do away with the emotion because that's obviously vital in our life. Right. Absolutely, and that's, you know, <laughs> if I don't get any message across tonight, that's it, is deal with the emotions, accept them. You know, the denial is fine for a period of time, 
you know, it does help us to get through the initial shock, but then we have to feel them. We have to bring them to the forefront. And as I was saying a minute ago, all of our emotions are normal and healthy and have an appropriate place in our life. And if you think about depression, as, as um, Janae was saying, that is such a hard one because we feel so bad. But the purpose of depression is to heal, to go inward, to, to um, eliminate distractions in our life energy drains, you know, if we're worried about this and worried about that. We don't have enough energy left over to heal and to take care of ourselves. So it's really, really important to recognize, okay, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling depressed. I won't feel this way forever, but I'm going to try and listen to that because maybe right now I need to go inward. I need to take care of me. I need to understand. I need to get whatever that feeling is back up here so I can put it into some kind of framework in my life. So it's okay to cry at some point until your eyes get off? Absolutely, <laughs> please, yes. She said, she asked, so is it okay to cry until the point your eyes are very red? And I believe we're all saying a resounding yes. Um, we, uh, where I work, Cancer Connection um, puts together caregivers who have gone through a caregiving experience to people who are in, the, in your role, who are currently caring for somebody. And it is amazing how many people say, the cancer survivors or the cancer folks will say, it is harder on the caregiver. And there's no clean margin. So sometimes we, I think we're beginning to think at times of cancer as, I got diagnosed, I got treatment, I got better. And our, we can't, as a caregiver, you can rally to the cause. Someone's sick, they've gone to the hospital, let's all rally round. You can't stay in that fight or flight and high energy and you can't stay there permanently. And I think with, you know, just agreeing with the other ladies, some time to collect, to take care of yourself, trust your intuition. And, and yeah, take care. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a question, I'm sorry. I'm you mind stepping up to the Gotta come to the mic. We want to hear you. Yeah. 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 Um, my, I, I'm sorry. I came in late, so this may be something that was actually covered. But uh, when I went through can through my cancer treatment, I had this big fear um, in dealing with my children, and um, it was something I didn't. I I, I I didn't know how to express it because I didn't want it to come out as pain painful or shocking and all those things that cancer is when you when you first get it and I was kind of wondering what your thoughts were on that uh, okay. living okay. here in Austin I have this like knee-jerk response of um, wonders and worries but do you ladies want to address that one well um, as far as talking with children we talked a little bit about this in my last presentation when we talked about relationships. Um, what you have to take into consideration, of course, is the age, age of the children. So what you're going to say has to be age appropriate. Um, something else I think you have to pay attention to is whether or not you're in a good place when you decide to talk to your children. Um, what I think is really important is that your children will cue off of you. Yeah. And so if you explain to your children that, you know, mommy or daddy is sick and has to undergo treatment and things are going to change, uh, they will take that in. They will be able to deal with that. But what's important is that your emotions are something that you're aware of so that you're not trying to have a discussion with them but your sadness is for front and foremost uh, because we want to be able to give them information and address what they need to hear answer their questions but 
depending again on their age, you're trying to convey the fact that you're the grown up and they're the children and no matter what, they're going to be okay, they will be taken care of, they will be loved, and that together as a family, you all can come together and to support each other and be there for each other. So again, I want to stress this message that you don't just blurt things out to your children. Maybe you would need to talk with somebody and even practice, do some rehearsal so that you can feel uh, more comfortable about what you want to say, how you want to say it, that sort of thing. But um, I really would encourage all of you to say something to your children because they're sponges and they are going to be absorbing the emotion of what's happening with you and, and your spouse and, and family members. And if they have no information, they're going to be more frightened. So you want to add? I think just to reinforce a couple of things that you just said that, um, you know, letting them know that, no, that they're going to be okay, that they're, they're, they will be, their needs will be met. And secondly, you know, the I'm fine, everything's fine. The disconnection between what you say and how you're actually feeling, the little sponges, they know, and that they need to be able to trust you. The trust is number, is number one. And um, I've just, that's wisdom I've heard time and time again. And in the families I have worked with, the families that communicated to their children at a developmentally appropriate and straightforward way, those children were given, those children were, had skills to cope. Children can be amazingly resilient if you can be honest, honest and loving with them. And as Dell said as well, if you're struggling with that yourself, turn to someone who you feel is a professional that might be able to help you. Because this isn't something you ever anticipated to talk to your children about. You were going to say something there? You have to come up. I was just going to amen your wonders and worries thing. Mm -hmm. um, so actually when I got diagnosed uh, 18 months ago, someone suggested that and much to my discredit, I blew them off. Um, and I talked to my daughter about it plenty and I actually showed her my MRIs and such. Mm -hmm. And then I collapsed uh, about a year after the surgery. Um, anyway, and then I finally called them. And and I've talked to my daughter about it a bunch of times, but honestly, until Wonders and Worries stepped in, until I got some help from a professional, my daughter's five years old, mm -hmm. just as a reference point. We'd never used the word cancer. It was always a boo-boo in daddy's left temporal lobe. Interesting. And uh, so, I mean, I talked to her, she'd been to MRIs, but I think that, like anything else, starting to people who are smarter than you and have more experience, um, both with kids, you know, I've only got the one kid, it's the only time I've ever done it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, bet she's smart. I mean, that's why I'm here. I, I, I wish that I had done a lot of this stuff a year and a half ago. Uh, but with all that said, uh, um, especially with, with kids or even for yourself to some things in life are better late than never. So, and to quick, quick plug Livestrong again, I, I didn't know this at the time that until we went to their ball. Apparently that was the first organization that Livestrong ever founded, which made me a, a bigger fan of the yellow Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'm 57 years old. I have a seven and eight year old and they've been in Wonders and Worries for about four or five months now. So I agree. It's something that really helped us talk about it. I've been doing a lot of, um, presentations recently. I have um, non-small cell adenocarcinoma of the lung and I'm stage four metastasis in the bones and things. <clears throat> Turns out I may be lucky because of a gene mutation which perhaps can uh, turn it into a chronic thing instead of what was you know certain short life basically. One of the things I wanted to say um, and I feel that a little bit less here tonight but um, Many of the presentations I've been to recently, I feel like um, glosses over people like me. It's almost as if you're afraid to 
include in the conversation. You know, you because you say, well, you you get sick, you get your treatment, you get better. Sometimes you don't get better, and sometimes you have to tell your children that you might not. And the first four months, you know, I was operating under an assumption that I wasn't going to be here, you know, throughout this year. And we sold the house, and I was fortunate because I'd bought life insurance, and I have 401ks, and my partner and my children will be fine that way. The only thing that can really screw this up is if I live a long time, because I don't know how we'll fund that. But, um, but I, I feel some sort of... Um, it's strange. I've been a GLBT civil rights activist for years and a number of things, and I, I almost want to start a, a civil rights organization for stage four people. It's like we're here, talk about us, include that in the conversation because um, it's uncomfortable. But there's a whole lot of people that are listening out there that aren't going to get well. Um, they may be healed, but they won't get well. And, and uh, so I want that on the table. Thank you. And just to clarify with the, the statement about wonders and worries, it's, they'll never say, tell your children everything's going to be okay, right. just that they'll be taken care of. So, well, um, Steve, I'm one out of six patients that is suing the U.S. Patent Office in Myriad Laboratory for granting a patent on the breast cancer BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. And so I know where you're coming from because I'm BRCA2 positive. So I couldn't get a second opinion because a one company has a monopoly on that. And I know where you're going with that. Um, within my group, um, in fact, I, I really agree with you because I think that the emotion about having to live with it the rest of your life is swept under the table because everybody wants to hear these success stories. You know, the, oh, I beat it. Or, you know, I am, you know, Just I... Stay positive. Exa exactly. It's like, I beat it, you know, and, and or you see that person crossing the finish line, you know, and it's... It's like the, the people that, they are left out. Um, I've, I've got 49,000 women in my breast cancer group. Many of them are stage four in living with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, in, in the conversations that erupt from th that segment of the group are very emotional. And um, I, think, I think that was a brilliant statement that, that I think a lot of times that people in your situation are kind of swept under the rug and it's, it's, there's, it's not fair. And you guys are um, battling it and you're in war. I call people that are going through treatment veterans because I believe that you're a war. And so you, you never would think these things that are happening to your body, how your body's changed, how you're mentally changed. Um, it, it literally is being involved with things that you never would think that you were gonna see in your lifetime. It's crazy. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Online um, that I wanted to bring up a little bit around men and women and how potentially differences in how they deal with emotions. I wonder if anyone feels comfortable speaking to that. Um, there's just been some conversation online that I wanted to bring up around men and women and how they may cope differently with emotions and how you could support your potentially opposite gender loved one who may be coping with things differently than you may. And I don't know if you could feel, if anyone feels comfortable speaking to how men and women may cope or experience emotions differently. Oh, well, if you could go to the, I would, sure, that would be great to get your feedback. As a man. <laughs> Um, that, uh, that was, pro that topic specifically is probably the, the, the most, uh, in hindsight, the most emotional part of what I went through with colon cancer. Um, I came to a, I came to a presentation, I, I believe you, you held Dell, um, and in the middle of that presentation, um, it was discussed. You know, it, it 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 discussed couples, and at that moment, at that at that very 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 moment, it was the first time that I went back to when I was going through the cancer, and I, I mean, it was it wasn't just a thought; it was the emotion itself. I felt the emotion, and uh, uh, what I realized, um, my wife my wife really didn't talk to me a whole about it. She. Um, not and I, and I don't think and I'm and I'm certain it's not because she didn't care, but um, 
Well, what it taught me was, and the things that I kind of like to talk about when I talk to people about cancer in these situations, um, for me personally, there was a there was a huge emotional um, connection, and our, our communication was not done verbally. Her concerns weren't done verbally. It was, everything was emotional. You know, she 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 understood where I was at, and she understood my concerns, and she understood. And and, she, and in the same breath, she gave me the the, the freedom while doing that to deal with it in a way that I was comfortable. Um, that's how I became involved with Live Strong. You know, it was through 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 the counselor and through the nurse. She let she let she let me have the privilege of using my resources to get through the situation. That's great. Let, let me talk a little bit in general about uh, emotions and the differences between men and women. You know, as I said earlier, we all come with the basic emotions, regardless if you're a man, man or a woman. But the experiences that we have in our life and the messages that we get along the way affect our emotions. Again, you know, we're having experiences, we're taking in new information, and it's affecting our emotions. So what has been classic, hopefully that's changing, but we teach our little boys that you shouldn't cry, you need to be strong, you need to be in charge, uh, you know, messages along those lines. And, you know, women often get the message that, well, it's okay to, to cry and be weak and emotional and that sort of thing. And so sometimes what happens is that, um, you know, you have these shoulds in the back of your mind about the way you're supposed to be as a, as a man or a woman. But then you're faced with a situation that all of that kind of gets blown out of the water. Because say you're a man and you're the one with cancer and you're the one that you're having to go to your spouse or your family or friends and ask for help. And you know that may be causing all sorts of difficulty for you because you're supposed to be the head of the family or the strong one or just the man, you know? Um, and so that is a whole other layer of emotional difficulty and even practical difficulties that you may have to overcome. Uh, but some of the things that can come out of this type of tragedy is that you do relate more closely to your spouse or your family members or friends and that you come to recognize that um, you're more than a man or a woman and more than just the roles you fulfill but it can help people to become much more intimate and much more connected to each other. So, just a few thoughts about that. Any? I have one last question. Okay. Um, uh, recently, in the last couple of days, I found out that a very good friend of mine, um, which she, it's a female, um, has, has kidney cancer and I mean my live strong spirit came out and you know I talked about the things that we can help her with and what have you and gave her the guidebooks and and you know opened her eyes a little bit but she's going in th this Tuesday to have that kidney taken out and I just don't I, I, I really have been struggling with how to, to go visit her and how and you know how, how to deal with that you know, I mean when I usually when I go to a hospital I don't know that person but it, you know there's there's a, there's a certain friendship that's there with, between myself and Ann and I'm really 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 struggling with how how to I'll take this one um, so you've been there done that right um, you know what it's like you may or may not have had surgery, I don't know. But what people really need is for someone to listen, number one, if they want to talk about it. But number two, practical stuff. I mean, you can do stuff for her, whether that be 
getting people to clean her house or bringing her a couple meals where you know frozen meals that she can just heat up or um, do the practical stuff I mean that's what we really all need um, it's funny women a lot of the times I've seen they go through cancer treatment we're, we're supposed to be these superheroes right where um, nothing can keep us down well I mean it comes to a point where yeah you're just tired you're weak you're going through this stuff you just need somebody to listen or help and that's how you could really help um, it, when you've got the knowledge like what you do because I have the same knowledge you would like for people to maybe you know sometimes you want them to take a certain course or you know do a certain thing or act a certain way that's really not our responsibility though our responsibility is to make sure they're okay to make sure that they're comfortable and if there's anything that we can do, but also suggest things. Hey, you know, let me, let me take care of the kids a couple nights so that you can relax. Let me, you know, cook you a couple meals. That goes a, such a long way. So those are the types of things you can do. Let me just add that um, by way of visiting in the hospital, I think there are a lot of wonderful suggestions. But I'm trying to encourage you tonight to really plug into your emotions. And if you take a little bit of time to really understand how you're feeling, then you can bring that to that hospital room. And you want to certainly be sensitive to her needs, so you're not just going to kind of take over the visit, but to express what's in your heart. And then, you know, maybe make it short, but then to invite that person to talk to you. How are you doing? I'm here. I understand. If you want to talk, I'm available. And that's what's really important. As a therapist, one of the things that I talk with my clients about, but particularly couples, is we try and mind map, which is reading each other's minds, and then we think about what we should say, what we shouldn't say. And we're so caught up in trying to do the right thing that we overthink instead of tuning in to our feelings. Because we know, I mean, particularly all of those who have been through cancer and, and all of this, you know what you want to hear or what you want to say. Trust it. It's okay. And you don't have to mind map, whether it's talking with your children or talking with someone newly diagnosed or what have you. Um, listen. Listen to yourself. Listen to them. And it'll work out. You'll work it out together. Great. Any other points? Questions? You have questions online? Or? Yeah, online there are some more questions. Um, there's been some more talk about the caregiver experience and how to support people when they may be pulling away. Um, so if you're a, care a caregiver of a loved one and they're pulling away from you, how to respect their coping strategy, but how to cope with it yourself because it may be hard that that loved one is, is pulling away. Oh, gosh. The caregiver experience, I mean, that could be a whole a whole thing in and of itself. Um, it's hard to generalize. Um, I guess I'm trying to think of, you know, this is your, your spouse or your, your boyfriend or whoever, and they're pulling away. Pulling away in the sense of, you went into this together, you, they got the diagnose together, diagnosis together, and now they're, you're wanting them to kind of go full head on and fight it and be this way and be that way and they're having a different reaction and they're they're quietening down and they're withdrawing and they're really thinking maybe I'm not too sure about whether or not I want to keep taking this chemotherapy. It's, there's just so many situations. Those are actually you're describing some of the specific things people are saying. Maybe someone who wishes to stop treatment or doesn't want to keep fighting or um, it, it doesn't want to communicate about it. Um, I've definitely experienced multiple times a discord between it's the you called it mind mapping mm -hmm. you have one part of the couple that is um, I really need to keep taking this treatment because I can't let my loved one down and then you have the caregiver thinking I really wish 
X, Y, Z, but I don't want them to, I don't want to influence their decision. And that can be an extremely heartbreaking and difficult time when you might be stage four or whatever the case may be. And these are precious moments. And, you know, I, I'm not the therapist, you know, I'm going to use that word communicate, um, but Dale, what, what do you, can you, we, Dale and I have talked a little bit about this. Well, one of the things that I think is important to recognize is that, you know, just as I said earlier, emotions are going to change, situations are going to change, uh, you know, the whole cancer experience is not beginning, middle, and end in a week. This is usually a pretty long protracted situation that you're going through and you cannot sustain any emotion for a long period of time so you know just as we were talking about your feelings about dealing with your sister it may be the kind of thing where you know you're you've been involved in the very intense beginning part of it and then things go on and on and on and one or the other of you gets tired and pulls back a little bit or a lot uh, and then sometimes you'll go through an angry phase or a depressed phase but if you're paying attention and you're dealing with those feelings and you're aware and you're using your breath that can help you to, to gain a little bit of objectivity, to think your way through it. So what might be helpful is if, you, say you're a caregiver and you're just overwhelmed, to be able to say to your partner, I'm overwhelmed right now. Um, I, I need to kind of pull back a little bit, acknowledge that that could be very helpful and I hope that that all of you out there have more than one support person Good point. you know that that you have reached out to family and friends and that you know if at certain points say your spouse needs some downtime that you have someone else that you can you know turn to and and help get your needs met come on up. yeah come on up Uh, my husband and I went through this exact same thing. I mean, in the beginning, it was very hard, and he was my caregiver, and he was with me 24 hours. I mean, and it was hard for him in the beginning. And then I got to where I didn't want to go to radiation anymore, and he was on me. Okay, get up. We got to go. Got to go. I mean, he was right on me, and I'd say, no, you know, didn't. no, come on, we're going, we're going. But he was just totally depleted because he was with me so much. He had just retired. It was really hard on him. So then I started feeling bad. So then he did go to my, my daughter and my son and said, look, you need, I need help. Give me help, you know. And then he even took a trip, you know. It was his birthday, and he went to Vegas, and I said, good, go, go, you know. And my kids took care of me. But he did. He got very depleted, and it wasn't his fault. He just didn't know what else to do. I mean, every single day, and I'm sick, and I'm sick, and he didn't know what to do. But at first, he got, got angry and just kind of went away, you know. And then he came back, and then he was okay. And then he, But he told the kids, he says, I need help. He says, take care of your well, mom. Just remember, this is a dynamic, changing yeah. process. Oh, yeah. You know, it's each and every day may be different. And, you know. And it's a long process. It yeah. was a year, year and a half. It was a very long process. And he had just retired. And then I just got sick. So I it was different. of you. I know. <laughs> it was so difficult. It was difficult for him. And then I started feeling really sad for him, you know, because he was, sure. you know, you could tell. And he was the strong one, never cried, never this, never that, never did anything, you know, just real strong you know and then he kept telling me okay we gotta go we gotta go and I have to say this day if it wasn't for him I probably wouldn't be here because I wanted to stop I was done you know I was tired I didn't feel good but he was very good you know and it's hard it's really hard you know they don't know which way to go you know and some of them I mean they just walk out the door and leave <laughs> they're done you know I don't want to do this and with so. caregivers Feeling resentment about the situation is not the same thing as feeling resentful of the person you love. You know, it, it, that's another one of those emotions to be aware of. 
your spouse, whoever, could be very, very tired, angry, irritable, pissed off, mad as hell, but it doesn't have, it's not necessarily because it's about you, it's, it's the experience and the cancer. I think I'm, I'm speaking to the, to the choir here, yeah. Well, I was dating a guy six months before my diagnosis, okay? That's not a really good way to start a relationship. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I have breast cancer. <laughs> um, it was really bizarre because I, I mentioned it. It's like going from Hunter, where guys like leaving cards on your car and flowers and to caregiver, like moving from Hunter to caregiver in a very short span. I mean, that's weird. Uh, and I read about that in my book because I think it's so odd, you know, that, that a guy has to, you know, move that quickly in that weird dynamic. But I to tell you, the communication was key. I mean, we had to talk it out. Um, all the stuff I was feeling, he, he, you know, he was wondering if I was in pain or if I was okay. Or um, in, in the beginning, we didn't. And it became very a, a huge problem. So. We had to sit down and, I mean, we shaved our heads together. He's ex-army guys, so really, like, you know, right before my chemo. Um, you know, um, but, you know, talking it out was so, so important. How are you feeling? Are you in pain? Do you need help? Are you tired? You know, all of those different things where I, I think many of us are so used to, like, being okay on our own and we're so strong and being strong by ourselves. We don't even know that role. We don't know how to ask for help, you know, like, hey, I just, I need some help. I mean, can you have my back on this one? You know, it's like, um, so communication was so, so important um, during, during that process. I guess the other thing I'd like to um, throw in here with regard to, to uh, caregivers is that a lot of times people feel guilty because they're having big feelings of depression, anger, what have you. And, you know, they're like, well, I'm not going through this. And so therefore, if I have feelings of resentment or anger, then I feel guilty. But I'd like to encourage uh, caregivers to pay attention to their feelings and to get help. You know, it's not just the person going through the cancer that may need the help. So, you know, seek out counseling or you may all uh, live strong may have services for caregivers but um, you know they're just as important a part of this process as the, the person actually dealing with the cancer so uh, just just be mindful of that that just because you're having certain feelings that maybe you're causing conflict it's normal and and it's not a, a cause for for guilt or shame mm -hmm. any other questions yeah so what about someone who has completed treatment and that concept of well the fight is over and you should feel great but you're still not feeling great but you feel like you should potentially fake it so you make it sort of concept to how, how to um, you cope with feeling like you're disappointing your loved ones if you're still not feeling great, but the cancer is done and it should be a celebratory time. Um, that's a tough one. Um, what, what they don't necessarily tell you when you're going through treatment is that there's a consequence to every treatment that you go through. All of you here know that, that have gone through it. So whether it be surgical, chemo, I mean, there's a consequence and we're all living with those consequences. So we're fundamentally changed. We're physically changed, we're mentally changed. I mean, we, we are fundamentally changed and there's no going back. It's a new way of living. Um, I think being, being very honest to the person that you're with about what you're going through and what you're feeling is huge. Again, communication is highly, highly important. Um, I, I think though there's also a form of accountability for the patient in that we as patients have to be accountable for uh, doing the right thing so that we prolong our life and that we don't live in pain and that we are doing everything that we mentally can through education in learning about what's out there to help us move forward. Um, we have to have accountability to 
not be that person that complains all the time that is, um, you know, the whiner that, that, you know, I mean, we have to take a, accountability for our situation and to do the best we can to move forward. And, and I highly recommend if people do have consequences for their treatment, that they are looking for answers, that they are trying to move forward, especially via education. Um, I'm a huge proponent of patient advocacy, but, um, but communication and letting them know that opposite person, whether it be caregiver, whether it be spouse, whether it be boyfriend, girlfriend, that, um, that you communicate everything that you're going through, but you do something about it. If you're not able to function at a certain level, you, you can try, you can try to move forward and get that ball rolling, whatever that looks like. Livestrong has so many programs that allow you to, to move forward physically um, and mentally, so. I'd like to make a, another point. <clears throat> the, the human body, as, as I said earlier, depression has a normal, healthy function. And if you all have gone through a long, protracted treatment, okay, the treatment is over. It doesn't mean the healing is over. It doesn't mean that everything inside of you is, you know, back to the way it was. You still may have lots and lots of healing, as well as emotional healing that has to take place. So if you are still feeling uh, less than energetic, or you're feeling down, or, or your energy level's compromised in some sort of way, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a clinical problem, but that you, you need more time. Now, hopefully, you're not just burying the feelings and, you know, you're, you're into a, a black hole. You know, that kind of depression prevents you from doing things that would help you to stay connected to life and enjoy life. I have a question for you along those lines, by the way. But, but nevertheless, you know, um, there may be a period of time after treatment where you're still having to be kind of more quiet and, and more in tune to what's happening inside. Uh, yeah. what, one of the questions that I have for Dale, and this, this is throughout a lot of communities that I see with people being treated for cancer, is uh, whether you're male or female, um, you guys know uh, chemo can shut down your hormones completely, like that. You know, and so, you know, you're left struggling, like, what, what's going on with me? I mean, am I normal? I mean, am I, what am I experiencing? I'm like all over the place. I mean, what steps do you take when that happens to you where a doctor may, it may be an automatic, you know, oh, I'm going to write you a script for antidepressants because we know that this chemo is going to shut down your hormones. I mean, what do you do? I mean, when you're left in depression and in that hole, because of a lot of it's drug related well you know i see a lot of clients actually who come into my office who have been through exactly that they might be say in their 20s or 30s and because of treatment that's the end of that as far as reproduction or just um, you know any other physical attributes that come around because of hormones and it's it's something that needs to be grieved and you know any any loss i mean the loss of your fertility the loss of uh your sex drive not that your sex drive is totally uh run by your by your hormones but you may be experiencing all sorts of changes and that um, that has to be grieved just like anything else has to be grieved. Um, I've so heard someone talk about cancer, or I've heard people talk about cancer, not just the cancer is the big thing to grieve, but so many other smaller losses along the way that, that take their toll as well and need to be acknowledged and grieved. And not that you stay there, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, they call it the grieving process, right? Because it, you go through different stages and phases and, um, you know, just as your feelings come up, you acknowledge them. And a lot of times, and, and again, as a counselor, uh, what I do is I am a witness to people's feelings. That seems to be a very healing phenomena is that you don't just carry 
these feelings by yourself, but you're able to speak them to someone else. Someone else is there to acknowledge, to appreciate, and, and just to listen. And oftentimes that's the grieving process. It's not like as a counselor I can say, oh, well, go do this, mm -hmm. or you know, you should think that, or the rest of it. Sometimes it's just as you feel it, it evolves. <clears throat> I'm going through the guilt of not feeling up to doing what I should be doing. Um, I'm a very private person. I don't share with everyone. And when I do share with at least one person, it's like, well, you just have to get up and do it. I don't feel like getting up and doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm one of these people. I can't stand dust. I want everything in order. If you walk into my office today, it looks like total chaos. And I don't like it, but I'm not there. I can't seem to get there. And it's been a while for me that I've been, well, I just had my port taken out, but I can't seem to get there. I, I, She was saying that she has always been a private person and an organized and control person. And uh, there is one person that she has been able to talk with and that person Tell me if I get this right. That person is saying, you know, just get up and go. Just, just get, get up, up and, and do go it. and just go do it. And that, um, you know, she's always lived a very orderly life, and now her office is kind of chaotic, and she's just having an extremely hard time uh, making herself do things that she should. But maybe I need to tell you the rest of the story. Oh, okay. I went through my own personal cancer, and Praise the Lord, I had a very good husband. He took excellent care of me. And just when I thought that after the confetti, like you say, and we had everything going and everything right, then he gets diagnosed. And I lost him. And I couldn't do for him what he did for me. And it's destroyed. I don't know how to walk out. need help but I don't know where to get it. Well there is help and you know sometimes when we go through these very <sighs> grab you by the neck experiences I don't know any other way to put it that we are going to have to tap into a whole other part of ourselves that we never knew we even had. I am very close to the Lord, and if it weren't for that, I probably couldn't even be standing here now. But there's days when I want well, to pull the covers over my head. Sure. And but if it I, weren't for Gloria, get up, let's go to lunch, I probably would pull the covers over my head. Yeah. But this may be that time in your life where examining that private part of yourself, it may be time to open it up some more and let some more people in. And that uh, it's nothing to be ashamed of, it's nothing to feel bad about, but you're going to have to feel your way through it. And I think there will be people who are more than willing to step up and help you through this. But, you know, anytime I hear the word should, mm -hmm. I call it the dirty S word. <laughs> because, you know, all the, the words stress, you know, should, all of those things create so much more difficulty for us in our lives. I said something about here in your picture, having trouble 
what I call digesting or something, and I think it's because of all that's happening, because I used to not have that problem. Yeah. Well, you can't take a deep breath. You know, everything is tight and constricted, and you know, that's why I keep saying, reside in the breath, the deep breaths help. They help you to think, to feel, to, you know, make progress. Uh, but the shoulds, shame, stress, should, the, all the dirty S words. Uh, one of the things about dealing with emotions and why I really, really want to encourage you to embrace them, to feel them, to, to acknowledge them, is once you begin to learn how to do that and you realize you can get through them, that's the thing about emotions. They don't last. Mm -hmm. No matter what you feel, they'll be gone. I don't, I don't know if this is true for you, but it's something to think about. When I was going through treatment, my physical world was in disarray. It mimicked my treatment because I felt like I had no control there. And so I let everything around me kind of go in total disarray. Just something to think about. Um, your external world might be mimicking what you feel with in what your husband's about to go through and in all of that because you don't feel like you have control yeah just a, something to think about mm -hmm. and i'm glad you you said you know you're in a, a private person i'm glad you were able to get up and say that to probably a lot more caregivers than are in this room <laughs> well for sharing that yeah and unfortunately it, it's time for us to start wrapping up so uh, I know that went by quickly and certainly just as a reminder um, you're we just really appreciate you all being here um, live strong is available for you all if you're interested in talking further um, you can reach us online you can call us you're welcome to come in and visit us in the center um, I'm sure our panelists welcome you to have um, some conversations with them after this but we will start to be wrapping up and just want to thank our panelists so much for being here to Penny and Dale and Janae. Thank you.